Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is Tony. I'm joined on the show today by Pastor Terry Bates and the message that he brings to us today in this interview I found very, very encouraging and I'm sure you all will as well. I am glad to be able to welcome Pastor Terry Bates back to the A Minute to Midnight show great to have you back on again today, Terry. Thank you, Tony. It's great to be with you and with the Minute to Midnight uh, audience and listener family. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a little while since you have been on, um, so can you firstly just give a little bit of a recap to the listeners of where you're based and what you do? Sure. Uh, we are based in uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in the United States, kind of uh, almost the, pretty close to the center point on the map. If you were to try to hit it, you'd get pretty close. And uh, I serve as the lead pastor of a congregation called Faith Church. I've been here 23 years at this location, been involved in pastoral and, and uh, other traveling ministry since I was 14. So over 42 years of traveling and speaking ministry. So it's been, it's been exciting to see what God has done through the years, and it's exciting to see what's ahead of us as well. Yeah, and last time I had you on, you'd had a few issues with um, like the LBGT community, etc., in your town. Has that sort of played out and resolved at all or quietened down, or is anything still ongoing with that? You know, it took place back in the month of May when we were uh, addressing some issues uh, that uh, awakened that particular community uh, towards us. There was some people who took objection to some conversation, biblical conversation we were having on that theme and uh, left our church. And uh, so there were some follow up pieces, obviously a lot of social media attacks. There were some on site uh, attempts to you know, try to discourage people from attending our fellowship and um, but probably now about 100 days later, uh, a little longer than that, probably now 120, 150 days later, uh, none of those ne- people that left us necessarily have returned. But we have had other people come to us as a result of the message we shared who uh, said they wanted to you know, align with us and, and help strengthen, hold our hands up. And so in many ways, I think God has replaced uh, the people that we lost with new people with the passion to stand for the inherent truth of the of the scriptures, and so we we celebrate the the recovery process that we've been through as we as we stood strong for our faith and our convictions. And you do um, quite a bit of outreach in the community and uh, different things like that too, don't you? So, which is really a very positive thing, I think. We do. We uh, every year one of our ma- major outreaches is called Feeding Five Thousand, where we reach out into the community. We invite five thousand people on campus. We give all their kids backpacks and school supplies and feed every family member, and and then we give some tools. We have about uh, some resources that we come alongside one thousand families after that event as a follow up to help families uh, have a better family, a stronger family. So if they're husband or wife is dealing with uh, gambling addiction or drug addictions or any kind of life controlling situations. We give them support group opportunities. We do some marriage enrichment uh, classes. We help parents with trying to how drug proof their kids. And so, you know, by the time you do that with 5,000 people, which comes out to about a thousand families, then it keeps you pretty busy just trying to help stabilize a lot of families and give them strength. But we're, we're so glad that people have stood with us and helped us to achieve that objective. That's great because there are so many attacks on the family these days and it's increasingly difficult, you know, with so many things that people are facing, temptations and then economic issues and all sorts of things are going on. So it is, um, it's great when I hear of people that are actually doing what they can to support and encourage families and, and struggling relationships and and that so that's a, a extremely positive thing in my book. You know, and I, I just want to encourage your listeners. You know, this has been something that we've developed over fourteen years as a church, but long before we were able to do something on this level, we were always trying to, to find a way to help a family, adopt a single parent mom, a grandmother raising a grandchild because the parents are maybe incarcerated or serving in the military somewhere, 
And so I don't want people to think that if it's not in 5,000 quantity, that it's not significant. If they help one family down the block or one coworker who's struggling or one grandmother who's having to raise those grandkids because the parents are absent at this time, they're making a huge difference. And accumulatively, this is really, I believe, where the body of Christ ought to be. Thank God for the large events that we can do, but it's really about trying to find a way to mobilize individuals. Even our event, we tell people in Oklahoma City and the Metroplex, make this your event. We don't, we don't, have, we don't know 5,000 people who need help. You know somebody and somebody else knows somebody. So go find that kid down the street or the family down the block or the coworker and say, hey, I know about a church who's doing this. So let's go there and let's let's connect you up. But at the end of the day, it's still people helping people, believers getting involved with showing the compassionate work of Christ. I call it not just share, not just sharing Jesus, but showing Jesus in a real meaningful way to a hurting world. And it is a hurting world too, and increasingly so as we see so many things happening and all around us, things getting more difficult and um, and people can feel more hopeless at times, more desperate, more uh, anxious. And so it's important, I think, that we have uh, some positive things going on that people can look at and go, hey, these people are actually doing something and making a difference and not just bogged down by all the negative stuff that they see going on around them. Absolutely. So we applaud it, we encourage it, and hope we inspire a little bit more of it as as we go along. It sounds inspirational to me. And um, sort of looking at things that are going on, you know, it, it can seem for people hopeless at times. And so even, you know, we, we are encouraging people to, to pray. And I mean, I think all of us could do better at that. I, I know I certainly could do better and be more consistent with how I pray and, you know, the way I do it and how often I do it and and things. And I'm sure a lot of other people will be f- probably the same. I don't think most of us wouldn't go give ourselves an A1 tick for our prayer life. Uh, Maybe a few people can, but for a lot of us, we don't. But then I think it can be that some people um, wonder what's the point in praying? You know, does it actually make any difference? And I, I believe you've got some really good answers on that. You know, it's been a, a really intriguing subject for me, probably for most of my ministry, but it has really surfaced significantly in, I think, probably this year in a number of different ways. I mean, everything from, you know, our elections here in the United States to the global events that are happening with uh, the hurricanes and and tragedies that are happening and the instability in Europe. Uh, uh, obviously, as we think about the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, political and economic upheaval and everywhere we look. And so, you know, there have been people who come to me with, with, with this kind of question and they say, Pastor, what difference does it make to pray? Why, why do we even bother praying? Is it, is it not all these things are set in motion and they're just going to run their time out? Or if God is sovereign and he's, and we, we believe he's in control, then, you know, what difference would my prayer make about any particular situation? And so I do I do find that there's a lot of people who d- don't engage in prayer probably because it's it could come across or be perceived as some kind of a ritual exercise and uh, religious exercise. And, you know, we're, we're becoming less uh, attached and affectionate uh, towards religious or even ritualistic activity. Uh, and until I think we discover the real principle behind prayer, I think, as God intended it, um, and to, to understand how prayer really works and why it works, then when we, when we understand some of those principles and learn them better, then I, I believe people will want to engage in prayer because they're seeing a more fruitful prayer life as a result of that. Nobody wants to pray if they never see answers to prayer. Nobody wants to pray if you know, it's just like it's defeatism. Man, I pray and pray and pray and nothing happens. Uh, but if we can show them maybe how to pray more effectively, how to pray more appropriately and in line with Scripture, and they begin to see the fruit of their prayer life, then I think people will, you know, really, if I can use the word in a different fashion, I think people will become addicted to prayer because they'll start seeing how much of a difference 
prayer really does make, not only in our lives, but in the lives of the people and the situations that we're praying about as well. That's um, that sounds yeah very very positive and and inspiring. Just hearing you say that, and I imagine that you would have some stories that you could tell of answers to the prayers that you can pinpoint. I can, you know, uh, my my own life. Obviously, as I journey back through and think about uh, the role of prayer, both in a personal life and in the ministry can reflect back on those times when I can distinctively say I would have attributed the result to the fact that I prayed about something and and God intervened on my situation. I, I can also tell you that there are probably some times before I learned better about the prayer elements that I probably prayed and probably thought to myself, maybe God didn't ever answer that one. But in reality, prob- he probably did answer it. He probably did so in a manner that was not what I was expecting or the way I was expecting it. But I've come to realize that that God has committed himself to this element of prayer. In fact, it, it might be a little bold of me to say, but and I'll certainly, uh, as we continue our conversation, give some specific illustrations of how I think prayer has worked in my own life and others as well. But I, I wanted to, to kind of give this declaration, I think, for people listening, because I think people need to understand that God, in in my understanding of the scriptures, God has in his own volition placed himself under what I call the law of prayer, which simply means that God has put all kinds of spiritual and natural laws into place as a part of creation and a part of his scripture. And even though he is sovereign and he could at any time override any of the natural or spiritual laws that he's put into place, and there are occasions when he has done so, by and large, he likes to place himself under the cooperation of those laws that he's put into place so that we know what to anticipate, so we can look to a reliable, consistent system. Let me me try to illustrate that in a couple of different ways. Um, Let's go to the natural laws that he's put in place in creation, the law of gravity. You know, something is a heavy object. Uh, it's heavier than the atmosphere that it's in. So if you elevate it, it's going to fall down. What, As we often say, what goes up must come down kind of idea. And yet we can clearly see in Scripture that there is that provision whereby he could insert himself and keep something that was falling from being destroyed as a result of that fall. For example, when Jesus was in the wilderness with Satan And Satan pulled that scripture from uh, the Old Testament and said, why don't you throw yourself off this high mountain and see if God's angels will catch you before you hit the bottom? Will will he interrupt that that process and keep you from being harmed? Um, I say there's a natural law of the human kingdom and the animal kingdom. Humans have a language, and and now we know multiple languages across the world that we speak. By and large, the animal kingdom has its own language, or maybe also by its various animals, they have a means of communication. By and large, those animals do not speak human languages. Now, we know biblically there's an example of a donkey who spoke uh, to a prophet. So God overrode the natural law to accomplish a divine purpose, but it's an exception to the rule. It's not the everyday process. And and the reason for that is God wants to keep order and not author an atmosphere of chaos or uncertainty, like stability and reliability and consistency in his kingdom. And so in in a, a translate over that into the spiritual realm, God has put certain laws into place. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Um, in creation, everything reproduces after its own kind. Um, And one of those spiritual laws that he put into place is the law of prayer. And he he said in Scripture that if we will engage the spiritual law of prayer to which he has committed himself to under his own volition, he's obligated himself to hear and to respond to prayer, that when we engage in that process, now we're stepping into the way God does things or his order of his kingdom and he responds accordingly. A couple of examples in Scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, well-known verse of Scripture for many people. 
God says, call upon me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things which you did not even know. In, in Psalm chapter 50 and verse number 15, the Lord said, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. In, in Isaiah 58 and verse nine, he says, you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and the Lord will say, here I am. And so what we have in scripture is we have people throughout the Bible who understood that the way God interacted with the human race, one of those key ways was through this relationship called the law of prayer, that if we would call out to God, if we would cry out to him in a spirit of prayer, then he has obligated himself. He's entered into this relationship where he says, that's a law I put into place, that when you pray, I will listen and I will answer. Now, he didn't say he'd always answer the way we wanted him to, but he will put an answer into place. So God is a God who's listening. When you get to the book of Revelation, you find out that his that our prayers are so valuable that they're pictured as being put into a vial and, and valued uh, before the throne room of God. So I just like the idea and the theology that God says, look, I'm giving you a spiritual law that you can engage. When you pray, I'm going to hear you, and I'm going to answer that prayer because you prayed. Paul, the so apostle, I think it's dynamic. Yeah, and the Apostle Paul said pray without ceasing. So, I mean, you can't pray, like you can't be on your knees praying 24 hours a day. So there must be something uh, of a, an attitude, I suppose, of a constant communication with God involved in that. Would that be right in your opinion? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I call it a spirit of prayer. You know, the, the scripture talks to us about maintaining certain attitudes and certain spirit and talks about singing and making uh, singing and making praise in your heart, you know, as you go through the day. One of the things I love to do is I love to keep whatever room or atmosphere I'm in, I love to keep gospel music playing in the background, just kind of one of my prefer preferences. And what I notice is that even when I walk out the room and I get in the car and if I haven't tuned the station to some gospel music, I notice that there's like this melody that's in my heart at the same time. And then whenever I see something or something comes to my mind, generally as a prompting of the Holy Spirit, maybe I remember someone's in the hospital or maybe I'm seeing an accident about to happen. And I just, oh God, please, you know, help them to get out of that situation. Or I remember that person that's going into surgery today. So I think it's about keeping that attitude or that spirit of both praise and worship and the spirit of prayer that you have that communing relationship with your heavenly father that it's not like you got to go down the hall and knock the, knock on the door or make an appointment with him. He's accessible to you as you as you call upon his name in prayer. And so uh, what about the difference between praying out loud, so speaking words out loud and just sending like an arrow prayer in your thoughts to God? Is there, What's the difference? Is there much difference, do you think, in the power of those prayers or do they do, serve a different purpose? Um, well, how, I, how do you think? Well, I think God's going to hear both of those prayers. There's no questions about it. But I think when people do pray out loud, this is maybe a theological perspective for me. I believe that we're speaking into an atmosphere that may have a dark influence, a spiritual warfare environment, a, a demonic act, uh, environment of oppression or discouragement or weariness. And so sometimes when we pray out loud, I've been in a circle of prayer with people where maybe they were dealing with something pretty serious and and we held hands and we could have all silently held hands and kind of prayed on the inside. And, and all of us would have been benefited by that individually. And all of us would have had the confidence that our prayers were heard. But when we prayed out loud and someone began to share their heart and say, pray for me or pray for that person that's struggling or pray against that, I began to feel the atmosphere that I was in change because prayer not only changes us on the inside, it changes the atmosphere that we find ourselves in around us. So I like I like the opportunity to pray out loud. I don't think it's always necessary, nor do I think, you know, that it should be to the point that it's confusing for everyone uh, or or chaotic. But I do like 
public praying, and I, I love it even in concert of prayer. I love it when when believers are all called together at maybe one time, and sometimes the clergy will pray, and they're all listening and affirming in their hearts, and other times when those people are said, why don't you lift your hands and lift your voice and pray individually at this time? I just feel like it sends something dynamic into the atmosphere um, that pushes back that oppression and those negative feelings that may be out there and creates an atmosphere of faith and expectation that God is going to intervene in that situation. And what about on situations like um, you know, on a national scale or international scale or things that it would seem that the Bible says, you know, such and such is going to happen, it's prof- prophesied, and then people can go, well, it's going to happen anyway, so what's the point in my praying, uh, you know, b- b- in terms of prophetic events in the end times and different things, and, and even, let's just say, the election in America right now. You know, people say, oh, it's predetermined that uh, person X is going to win the election, or that's just an example. So what about prayer in those situations? Well, I am a believer in the fact that there are certain things that have been preordained, or as some prefer the term, predestined by God, in his master calendar of, of events. I do believe that at some point, those prophetic events of the end times are going to unfold We may not see them in sequence the same way he sees them or others, and you have respectfully dealt with that many times in your communication, to which I appreciate greatly. And my role here is not to delve into that timing of issues either, but to simply say I do believe that there are certain things that are absolutely going to happen. There is going to be an Antichrist. There is going to be um, a a battle uh, for Jerusalem in my mind. There is going to be ultimately a day of accountability where— People are going to stand before God. These are unchangeable events. Now, when those events are going to take place, to the best of my understanding, seem to be somewhat of a moving target. Uh, In the New Testament, the scripture says that many people say, where is the coming of the Lord that that everyone has spoken about? Why, Why hasn't he already returned? And the response back is that the only reason why he has not returned at this time is that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, indicating that maybe he's leaving the door of opportunity open a little longer for things to uh, take place. There's, in my mind, there are hard events, character roles, uh, Antichrist, Judgment Day, uh, things that are set in place by God's divine plan that are unchangeable. But A, the timing of some of those things, I do think have variables depending on what's happening and how believers are praying. And secondly, I believe probably maybe even more importantly is that when we pray, we are are determining not only our role or position in those timing of events, but we may be influencing other people's attitudes or role or position in the events prescribed. For example, what I mean by that is um, uh, I believe that that you know whoever's going to be elected, uh, the the heart of people uh, could be changed or altered. Uh, and let me go. I should have went, and I prefer to go to maybe the the end time event. I believe that when you read the Bible, there is a great falling away. Yeah. There is a a great apostasy that happens. But at the same time, I believe there's a great revival. Mm. I believe there's a great soul harvest that's going to come in. And I think when we pray. We're praying to determine who's going to be in which equation. Are they going to be in the falling away side, or are they going to be in the great harvest side? And that's what I think our prayers affect, not the fact that there's going to be an end, a, a, a ending point, but who's going to be in the falling away and who's going to be in the harvest of salvation as we approach those timing events. So I think we're affecting human affairs, uh, not necessarily changing God's divine ordained plan that's going to unfold. That's a great point. Yeah, I I agree. That's um that's a very good way of looking at it. And I I mean I do get a little perturbed when I hear people setting dates on certain things. Um, you know that the rapture is going to happen at such and such a time, or that this is going to happen on such and such a date. The economic collapse is going to happen on a certain date, and 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 you know, that can end up like a boy crying wolf if those dates come and go and those things don't happen and in some cases maybe 
it was an option that things could have happened on that time, but, but God's delayed the timing. I mean, who knows until we get to heaven to know the answers to some of those things. But I do, you know, feel that we have to be a little bit careful around that and allow God the room to move. We can see the signs, and yeah, the falling away is happening. It's becoming increasingly obvious, and it, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist if you study prof, Bible prophecy to see that the prophetic end time events are actually happening really increasingly rapidly. But like you say, we can actually change through prayer uh, where different people fit as individuals in that time, even if we can't change the whole overall picture. And um, have you got then some examples that you can share from your own life where prayer has been answered in a, in a way that's very obvious? It is. Um, you know, uh, I had a I have a brother who, uh, uh, when he turned 16 years of age, like uh, most young men in the United States, they love to go out and get their driver's license at that particular point in time. And um, he went out and got his driver's license that day and not being a skilled driver. And at the time, our place of residence with my family was out on a rural area of the United States uh, in country dirt roads. They weren't even paved roads. And one of the things that about uh, dirt roads and is that graders come through and they grade the road and they try to clean out the ditches, as we call them, on the side so water drains off better. But uh, as the as the grader had come through this particular part near our home and he had cleaned out the ditches, instead of leveling the dirt in the middle of the road, he had left it piled up high with the intentions of coming back the next day and leveling it out. My brother, who was a, a new licensed driver, inexperienced driver, going faster than what he should have been on a dirt country road, uh, topped a hill at a high speed and unable to negotiate the pile of dirt that was there left in the middle of the road, uh, leaped like a rocket into a field. His friend was thrown out of the vehicle and my brother crashed in the in the field with the steering wheel uh, jammed into his abdominal area. They rushed him to the hospital and uh, in the emergency room, if I, if I remember this correctly, and there may be a medical professional that would stand to correct me on this, but give me a little latitude, but I believe they told us something like your human body has at any one given time 13 units or pints of blood circulating in your circulatory system. And they said that when they put my brother on the emergency table and opened up his abdomen to determine what kind of damage had been done at that time, they estimated that eight out of the 13 units of blood fell to the floor and he had less than five units remaining in his system, barely keeping him alive. So the doctors came out, give my family that report and said the probability of survival, to be honest with you, is extremely, extremely low. But we're going to do everything we can to save his life. When when my mother and father heard that, they immediately you know, called us into prayer. But in particular, my mother, who uh, all there's probably many people who can reflect on a praying mom or a praying grandmother somewhere in their life. My mother went over to the restroom who in this particular emergency waiting room was um, uh, kind of a family bathroom. Men and women could use it. There wasn't separate restrooms. So she went in and I heard her lock the door. And I was I was only about 14 years of age at this particular time in my life. And I heard her lock that door. And I heard my mother begin to travail, weeping and crying out to God about my brother and saving his life. Lord, give him another chance. I mean, any of the words that you might have anticipated a mother would want to pray for her son, whose life was literally hanging in the balance at that time. And somewhere during that prayer time, uh, I heard the fervency and the tone of her prayer, the intensity of her prayer begin to shift. And in, from one of, of, of great stress and, and appeal to one of gratitude, uh, thank you, thanking the Lord for hearing her prayer, thanking her, thanking the Lord for sparing her son, thanking the Lord for saving his life, and and those kinds of words were now flowing out of her. And in a little bit later, uh, he opened, she opened the door and came out, and she's wiping the tears from her face, and she looked at us as a family, and she said, "It's going to be all right. I've, I, I, I feel like the Lord has heard my prayer, and I believe He said to me." He shall live and not die. And medically, there was no evidence that that could happen. And the doctors continued to work feverishly. Later, we heard that 
multiple times. My brother uh, died on the surgical table while they were trying to save him. Uh, but, you know, I believe God gives doctors their wisdom and their capacities as well. And the doctor came out and said, it's a miracle, but we've been able to, to save your son. We've been able to uh, spare his life. He's got a long way ahead of him, but, but he is going to live. Those were the words of the doctor. He's going to live and not die. And they were almost the exact words that my mother had spoken that she felt impressed from the Lord. And so at a very young age, I believe I saw the power of prayer um, in in the case of my own brother, whose life was literally saved and is still alive today, uh, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, because I believe of the prayer of my mother getting a hold of, as we often illustrate, the horns of the altar and and just crying out to God with that level of fervency and asking God to supernaturally intervene in the matter. That's yeah, that's encouraging. That's great. Yeah, I think we all benefit from hearing things like that because they really do increase our faith. You know, I find those sort of testimonies uh, very very encouraging. Yes. So, um, what else have you got? Any other examples in in recent times that you could pinpoint? Yes, you know, we talk about the uh, the event of feeding 5,000, and um, one that really stands out to me in relationship to this was the very first time we endeavored to do this particular outreach, not knowing how we were going to pay for it, how all the pieces were going to come together. And um, so during the summer months leading up to that particular outreach, every Sunday I had been preaching from the story of the Bible, feeding of 5,000. Of course, it's the only miracle that Jesus did that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. And um, and and so here we are uh, believing it's a priority message. And so I'm preaching it and preaching it and receiving offerings and asking people to donate to the cause. And, and two weeks away from our event, we're still significantly short on reaching the budget necessary to cover the expense for the school supplies, the backpacks, and the food that we're going to feed people with. And so I preached a message two weeks before this event, and I featured the story about the boy who gave up his lunch. And I called the sermon that day, The Boy With No Name. And um, because his name is never mentioned in Mm. Scripture. He He stands out, but he doesn't ever get an honorable mention of his name in the Bible. So I preached the message that day, and to be honest with you, I thought I thought it'd come across pretty good, and I was anticipating that when they uh, heard the report of People's Chari- Charitable Spirit that day, that they were going to say that we had met the budget, but they came back to me and Monday and said, no, we, we still are significantly short. And I said, okay, well, we'll just keep praying about it because we believe God wants us to do this, and so we're going to pray and ask Him to provide for it. Our church sits on the two freeway interchanges in Oklahoma City, Interstate 40 and Interstate 44. So it's a major thoroughfare. And because of that and the fact that we have a daycare in our church, all of the doors on our particular campus are locked at all times. And we have security cameras and video capacity at each door. So if somebody approaches a door, they can ring the doorbell and we can interview them on the video camera to see if it's safe for them to come into the building and be exposed to children and to workers and those kinds of things. And on Tuesday, after I had preached a message about the boy with no name, a gentleman walks up and rings the doorbell and they look at him on the camera and he's a a tall cowboy looking guy, which is not uncommon for Oklahoma, blue jeans, cowboy (laughs) boots, long, a tall cowboy hat. And and they said, "Uh, can we help you, sir? And he said, yes, I'm here to talk to somebody about the feeding of 5,000. Well, the receptionist that day just kind of made a judgment call by his appearance and thought maybe he was wanting help. And so she said to him, sir, if you'll come back in two weeks and bring your family, we'll feed you and we'll give your children backpacks and school supplies. To which he responded, no, you don't understand. I'm not here to receive something. I'm here to give something for the feeding of 5,000. And I tell pastors all across America and churches all the time when I tell this story often that you may not have an appointment with the pastor, but if you use the word give, you'll almost (laughs) always get an appointment with the pastor. (laughs) And so they said, sir, come right on in. And they brought him into the receptionist area and they buzzed me in my office and said, pastor, there's someone here who wants to talk to you about feeding 5,000. And I said, I'm busy working on a sermon. They said, he wants to give you something. And I said, I will be right out. And I (laughs) (laughs) I ran out to the lobby to meet this guy. I believed he was going to be an answer to prayer. I was praying for that anyway. 
And so he began to introduce himself. He said, you don't know me. We live 60 miles away. We attend another church. We've never met. In fact, I didn't even know which church was doing this outreach for sure. We had heard about it on a on a little ad on a television show. It was a 30 second ad that we had run. And he said, we saw it. And this morning, about 2 a.m. in the morning, the Lord woke us up and said to my wife and I, go find that preacher in that church in Oklahoma City and help him feed 5,000 people. We've never met. That's all he'd seen was that 30 second commercial ad. And so he said, I've come into town and I've been going from church to church, knocking on the doors and asking churches, are you the church that's going to feed 5,000 people? And so a lot of people told us, no, that's not us. And that's not us. And finally, one of them said, you're looking for that church over at I-40 and I-44. And he said, that's how I got here. And I said, well, that's wonderful. I'm thrilled to hear it. And he said, well, I'm a cattle rancher and my wife and I, we love so winning. And, and we usually spend all of our time going to restaurants and, and neighborhoods and just talk to people about our relationship with Jesus Christ and invite them to have the same relationship. But a few years ago, the economy had a little downturn. We had to lay off our ranch hands. And as a result, we went back to taking care of the cattle ourselves. And so we don't spend as much time but we love winning the lost. And we heard that everybody that comes on campus for backpacks and school supplies, you're going to tell them the gospel story. So we decided that we would like to be a part of that. And then the next words he really got me with, he said, if you will let us, we would like to donate all the beef necessary to feed 5,000 people. Wow. And I said, well, man, I, I think I could let you do that, sir. <laughs> I think I could let you do that. And and he said, well, how many volunteers do you have? And I said, we have about 500 volunteers. He he said, well, we're going to make 5,500 patties. And he got on the phone, called his processor, and he said, I need 5,500 patties. I remember him telling the processor, I don't want the skinny ones like we sell at other places. I want the thick quarter pounders. I want these people to come on campus and have the best burger they've ever had so their hearts will be open to the gospel. And um when he got done, hung up the phone, he looked at me and he handed me his business card. And he said, if you have any problems at all with this order or have any questions, you call me personally and I'll take care of it. Well, I was glad he gave me his business card because I'm confessing to you that I had not paid much attention to his name. I was so excited about the word give that I didn't catch what his name was. So I didn't know who I was saying thank you to. So I was taking the business card and looking for a name so I could personally thank him by name. And the first thing I saw on the business card on the big side, on the first side, was an aerial view of his ranch in Winniewood, Oklahoma. And it was just a beautiful spread of land and cattle all over the place. And it was beautiful, but there was no information on it. So quickly, I turned the card over looking to say, thank you, Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so. But I still couldn't find their name because what had caught my attention was the name of their ranch first. And in big, bold block letters across the top of their card were these words, which was the name of their ranch, which was called the No Name Ranch. And the next words out of my mouth were, the boy with no name has grown up and he's got a ranch <laughs> in Wendywood, Oklahoma. <laughs> he didn't know what I was talking about, but I told him he was an answer to prayer. And so God had used the message that I had preached about the boy with no name and sent a man who owned a ranch called the No Name Ranch to come and help us with our first feeding 5,000. And he has continued every year to donate all the beef to feed 5,000 people. Wow. So there's a there's a, a story that really has a different twist to it. And, um, and, and yet we see God answering prayer in so many different ways. We've had people in our congregation who have been diagnosed with MS that the doctors have taken us and showed us on the, on the medical reports uh, and the scans, the, all the medical things that they look at. This is why this is it. This is, this is, these are the markers of muscular sclerosis and uh, we don't have a cure for it. And we've prayed and they go back and, and have all those tests run again. And the doctor says, I can't explain it, but there's no signs of MS. You are healed. You are, it's a miracle. You're, you're not, you're not, uh, sick with MS anymore. So we see them financially. We see them physical healings. We've seen people's lives spared because we believe that God has obligated himself, put himself in a position where he said, if you will pray, I will hear and I will answer. And of course, we do have to say we have to pray according to his will. And I think that's one of the qualifiers that a lot of people miss out on. That, those are really, really encouraging stories, um, and I'm sure our listeners will be encouraged by them. So I just I have one question that I'm sure some of them 
will have the same. It's like, how do we go about praying? You know, is there a formula or is there, is it just how, you know, where do we start? You know, say somebody even that's maybe a a fairly new Christian and hasn't done a lot about, of praying or hasn't been taught a lot about it. What would you say to them about, you know, where to go with it? The first and foremost thing that you need to think about is just be yourself, just like you're having a conversation with your best friend or or if you were going to somebody that you had confidence in and you were sharing your heart with them. That's really what we want you to do and what we believe you should do. We don't we're not trying to get people to pray King James Version language or anything like that. Just really open your heart. The Bible says that he already knows what you have need of even before you ask it. And then he said but ask. In other words, he already knows what's going on, and you're not going to give God a newsflash about some crisis in your life. You're not going to inform God about what's going on in your life, but you're going to come to him with confidence that he is a God who cares about your circumstances and wants to wants to receive glory and honor out of helping you through a particular situation in your life. So I tell people, Start off with just being conversational. Just be real with yourself. But secondly, I would tell people, especially those people who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, talk to God as your heavenly father. You know, I'm convinced that God hears the prayers of believers as well as unbelievers. Proof that God hears the prayer of an unbeliever is that any of us who are born again today we had to pray as an unbeliever, and God heard us when we cried out to Him. True. Yes, I've seen God answer prayers of unbelievers that that did not have a relationship with Him, and they weren't praying a prayer of salvation. But but God wanted to show up in their life to show them that He was a sovereign God. So I've seen people pray things like, "God, if you'll keep my daughter from dying, I'll, I'll get back to church, or you know, I'll recommit my life to you." So they weren't even praying the prayer of salvation, but they were asking God to hear their petition and and was entering into a vow. And by the way, that's not wrong either. Uh, the psalmist David, if you follow his story closely in the Bible, prayed over 100 different vows in his lifetime, saying, God, if you will do this, I will do that. And I believe that's what took him from being a shepherd boy to being a king is he learned to know how to enter into prayer covenants and vow covenants with God. So he, he even says in scripture, he said, Lord, if you will, if you will deliver me out of this circumstance, I will pay the vow that I promised to you when I was in trouble. So I do believe that God hears the prayer of the, of the, of the unbeliever as well as the believer. But I believe this, I believe the believer has an advantage over the unbeliever when they pray. And that advantage is the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. He is described in Scripture to us as our Heavenly Father. Jesus is described as a joint heir, a brother, if you will, in a spiritual sense, that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, that we are considered the children of the Most High God, sons and daughters in God's kingdom. And and Jesus, when he was here on earth, said to everyday people, If you being evil, and what he meant by that is you being human, not righteous or holy as God, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to his children? So I believe when you pray as a believer, you have an advantage because you can come to him and say, my heavenly father or my daddy, or as they say, we have the spirit of adoption and we've been adopted in so we can say Abba Father or Daddy Daddy. And that's different. You know, if somebody comes and knocks on my door, let me just let me restate this. If if I'm at home and my son or one of my daughters come and knock on the door of my house and I answer the door and they say, hi, dad. And I say, hello, son or daughter and call them by name. And I say, what can I do for you? They said, well, Uh, We don't have time to stay, but I need to know if I could borrow $50 real fast. Can I have $50? And I'm obviously going to say, well, what do you need $50 for? Do you, you know, you're going to do something that I wouldn't agree with 
they wouldn't, but I probably would just go through that logic in my mind or what do you need the 50 bucks for? And they say, oh, I'm out of gas and I, I don't have enough and I just need to get gas until I can get my paycheck this next week and, and I'll pay it back. And I'm like, oh, I don't care about payback. I'll just give you the $50. It's a good cause, a good reason. So the, I'll give them the 50 bucks without much, without much to think about it. But if, if somebody knocks on my door that I have never met before, I have no understanding of who they are and they knock on my door and say, sir, will you give me 50 bucks? Well, I'm going to investigate a little bit more and God's really going to have to talk to me about giving somebody I've never met before 50 bucks because I have no relationship with them. So I believe the advantage of the believer who has a relationship with Jesus Christ is we don't come like a stranger knocking on a door to somebody we don't know. We come talking to our heavenly father and say, daddy, I've got a situation here and I need your help with it. And if we pray those things that are obviously according to his will, things that would be pleasing to him, what, people say, what, what, what do you mean according to his will? I, I can shorten it up. I can say to people, would God want to be associated with the answer to the prayer that you're praying? Because a lot of people pray stuff that's pretty weird and crazy. Hmm. So I tell people, would God say, I'm glad to be a part of that. I'm glad to be associated with that. So pray according to his will and approach him as your heavenly father, as your daddy. And I believe you'll discover that there's real power in that relationship of praying. That's that's great. I love that analogy. Would I be able to actually get you to pray for our listeners? Oh, absolutely. I would be honored to do so. My heavenly father, as I come today on behalf of the many people who are listening today, uh, to this minute to midnight, there's a lot of things going on in different people's lives. Some are under great financial pressure. Their jobs are maybe not sufficient, under inadequate incomes. Maybe there's some people out there with loved ones that are in the balance of life or death, like my brother was when my mother interceded and stood in the gap and prayed for him. Maybe there's someone out there, Lord, that has a son or a daughter who, or, or a family member or a friend who doesn't know you. And as we see the great falling away across the world spiritually, we also believe there's a great awakening happening. And we want you to move them over from falling away to being those that are being awakened spiritually by putting the right people in their path that can share their own testimonies that could open up the door of the message of salvation in a, in an, uh, in an effective way to touch their heart and that they would be receptive to it. Lord, we pray for the world at large. We pray for the oppressed and the hurting Lord. I have seen the people who have had the most in wealth and I have seen the people who've had the least in resources and it doesn't matter whether they have abundance or they have nothing Lord, there is an overriding principle that 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 you can still give them peace because they can have all the money in the world and have no peace on the inside or they could be devastated economically, but still have peace and assurance that you're going to watch over them and take care of them. So give them what your word says is a peace that passes understanding. The mind cannot even understand why we are at peace because you've given us that sense of assurance that you're looking out for us, that you're taking care of us. Lord, we're reminded of that simple prayer that you even introduced your own disciples to. We often refer to it as the Lord's Prayer, but Lord, it was a model. It was a, a way of thinking about praying. So we are reminded, Lord, that we come to you as our Heavenly Father, that you are in heaven and that you care, and that we do want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want your will to be done in our marriages, in our, in our personal lives, in our finances, and in our health. We want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want you to give us this day our daily bread. Give us the provision that we need to be sustained and cared for and help us to forgive those who have trespassed against us. Because if we can't forgive people that we've seen, how can we expect you to forgive us of the things that we've done wrong towards you and against your kingdom? So help us to be people of forgiveness so that we can be forgiven people in the process. We pray, God, that you deliver us from evil. The enemy is on a rampage. Spiritual warfare and the attacks of the enemy are everywhere. 
He's trying to steal, kill, and destroy in every place he possibly can. But we pray that you would set boundaries around the people who look to you, that you would cause divine protection angels to encamp around about them that love you, to keep them, that Psalm 91 would be the prayer that we pray of protection upon our lives and our families. And Lord, we believe that as we call upon you, that you will in fact deliver us from the evil and from the evil one. And that ultimately we will give you all the glory and the praise and the honor that you have in the ways in which you have intervened on our lives and you have heard and answered our prayers because you said, if we ask anything in the name of your son, Jesus, so we ask in Jesus name that you would hear it and your father would do it, that the father may be glorified in the son. Therefore, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, that the Father and the Son may be glorified. Amen and amen. Amen. That was that was really great. Thank you. Uh, can you, before we close, just give the listeners the details of where they can find you, maybe if you've got a church website, and also exactly where they can find you in Oklahoma City if they're visiting? Thank you. We do have a website. It's OKC. That's short for Oklahoma City. So it's OKC and then the word faith, F-A-I-T-H, OKCfaith.com. You can find us there. They can hear our sermons online each week. We keep the current sermon and the teachings that we do on Wednesday night online for people to view and watch for absolutely free. You can also submit a prayer request online to us and that'll come to me as well as our prayer teams. And we would pray for every prayer request that is turned in. We have a team including myself, that pray over every one of them that's submitted to us. So we welcome the prayer time. Here in Oklahoma City, we're located at Interstate 40 and Interstate 44, crossroads of America and of Oklahoma City. I-40 and Portland Avenue is the actual street. It's Faith Church at Interstate 40 in Portland in Oklahoma City. And we would be honored to have anyone drop in and join with us in a time of worship on Sundays at 8.45 a.m. or 11 a.m., or Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock for our study in the Word. Thank you. That That's great. I've, I've really enjoyed having you on today, and I think it's been a very, very encouraging time, and I've certainly been blessed by it, and I'm sure our listeners will have been really blessed as well. So thank you, Terry, for uh, being on the A Minute to Midnight show today. It's been a privilege, and I look forward to another opportunity as the Lord will open and make that available to us. Thank you. Oh, you bet. We'll be definitely having you back. (laughs) All right. Thank you. Well, I'm sure most of you listeners will have found that about as encouraging as I did. It was really excellent, exactly what I needed to hear today. Now, you um, will find all of our shows at www.aminutetomidnight.com. That's night spelled N-I-T-E. We have a lot of articles as well as all our shows on the website and there is a donation button on there. Please uh, feel free to give to us if you desire to. That is how we keep this running is by your donations. All the music that we use on the shows is me having written, played and recorded it and you can find my royalty free music at rockshoresounds.com and there's a link to that on the A Minute to Midnight website as well and feel free to join our A Minute to Midnight Facebook group if you want to contribute that way uh, to the conversations etc too so that's it for today catch you in the next episode